Looks like we're head open. Yep. Okay. Hi, this is Nisha and now we're indoors. <laughs> you saw us putting the first shots through this gun here. This is a German MP40P pistol. This is a new product, 2017. It is manufactured in Germany by GSG, German Sport Guns. It is imported by American Tactical, ATI. They have in the past imported an MP40 pistol chambered for 22 LR. This, however, is chambered for the original 9x19 Parabellum Luger cartridge. So it is a center fire original caliber style gun. As I said, we, you just saw us putting the first shots through it. And we're also going to compare it to this gun here. We have a much older video on this one. This is an original Steyr manufactured. MP40 built in World War II originally and it was converted to a legal semi only by MK gun mods for me a couple of years ago so most all the parts on this are original there's a few like the receiver repair section back here that is new but this section up here and here this is all original receiver section as is the trigger group bolt and so on and so forth so I don't have full autos, it's just not something I can afford to do, nor really honestly want to do. I have too much fun with uh, bolt actions and pistols, so. But that's the closest I've got to any real MP40. At least at one time it real was one. <laughs> so we're gonna compare it to this one. First off though, we put about 100, 150 rounds through this before the storm came up. And it had no misfires, no failures to eject, no failures to extract, no feeding issues. It was 100% reliable, which is nice. And not all that common usually with um, some machine guns. This is not a conversion of any original. This is a modern day replica, and it's kind of a loosely done replica. It, it, they did a good job, do not get me wrong, but there are some major differences from original MP40s and from a semi-auto conversion like mine over there. That said, these are priced very fairly at around $550-$600 and they either come with one mag and a wooden crate or they come with a cardboard box and two mags. So that's nice. I, Me, myself and I I'd rather have the two mags in the cardboard box because what am I going to do with a U.S. made wooden crate? I mean, I guess I could cut it up for firewood in the winter if I needed kindling, but um, it's about the only use I can think of. It definitely doesn't keep the gun safe. If you leave it in the cardboard box without padding, it will scuff it up. First off, this is an entirely metal gun. I'm not going to say it's entirely steel, but it is metal. The only real plastic on it is what would originally have been Bakelite. The, this is actually the, the handguard originally, where you would grip it. And of course, the grip panels here. Originally, these would be made from Bakelite in the 40s. But of course, modern day, no one really does Bakelite anymore, certainly not 40s style Bakelite. So this is a modern plastic or polymer. It's a little more flexible than the original. It's also more durable. Bakelite, especially as it gets old, it's tough but brittle and it can easily crack. This stuff has enough flex to it that it should be pretty long lived. It's not metal reinforced or anything, but since it's just grip panels and stuff, it should be fine. Starting at the muzzle, we have a 10 inch long barrel, same as the original. We have a removable muzzle nut. It has a detent pin you press in and then you can unscrew it. Now interestingly, this not only holds the nut on, it's also what holds your front sight protector on. But we'll get to that in just a minute as to all the differences. We have a resting bar under the barrel. Barrel nut. On this side we have the ejection port. 
We have a fluted receiver section. We have a rear sight with two apertures. This is for closer range notch. You can flip this up to go to a longer range and then back down for closer. Moving back, we do have a hole cut in the lower frame for a buttstock. Although since this is imported as a pistol, it does not have one. You could install a stock. ATI says they are going to be offering a conversion kit later. Hopefully they actually do. I can see two ways of doing it. You can either put a stock on and make this a registered SBR. Or for people in states where SBRs aren't easy, since this is a threaded barrel, you could screw on a fake suppressor about six inches long and then pin it and weld it and make it into a carbine. This is actually how they've done quite a few of their 22s. So, flipping it over. We have a rear sling swivel here. Slot cut. The front swivel is up here. A bar, I should say. We have the cocking handle here. It does have the J-notch to hook it back with. And then uh, that's really about it. So that is a quick walkthrough. So let's start comparing. We're already saying this is a reliable gun tentatively. I'd still like to get a few more hundred rounds to it before I said conclusively. But first impressions, very reliable. So how does this gun differ from this gun? First off, I'm going to take the mags out to make room partially, but also so I can move this around. If you notice, the magazines are similar, but they are different. These are both double feed, uh, excuse me, uh, double stack, single feed. The original holds 32 rounds. The new ATI originally said it held 30, but then they downloaded that to 25 because it is very stiff spring. It even comes with this mag loader, which is polymer, but you really need this to load it to 25. You might be able to get 28 in. I've been able to once or twice. Now these, there are quite a few differences though. These are not interchangeable. Let's try it just to show you on camera. This is the original mag. It goes in, but cannot lock. Okay, that one it sort of did. <laughs> but it's not a good fit. It's very loose and sloppy. Some of these won't even lock. It catches, but the mag catch has a different shape. And here is the original gun. And this won't even go in. This magwell is slimmer. That's the reason. If you notice, the magwells, and we'll get into the guns, but they're a different shape and different material. We'll get to in a minute why. So the reproduction mag will absolutely not work in an original. And an original mag will sometimes fit in the ATI and occasionally lock in, but very tentatively because this is a fatter fatter magazine. They both have vertical ribbing as you see, but the, re the reproduction is much deeper, more pronounced. Same goes for the back. They are made quite differently. This one has, it's folded over with a plate welded in the back. This one on the other hand has a seam running in the front where it's folded over. And they are different enough but e that even this mag loader that comes with the ATI, the GSG, does not work on the original. It goes on, as you see, but it won't press down far enough. That's because the stops on this one are straight lines, just flared out steel. And on this one are actually much wider. They're dimpled steel. So, And, of course, the, uh, the base plates are pretty different too. Similar, but different. 
It's also worth noting this original mag is a little bit heavier. Yeah, a little, little heavier on the original mag. Looking at the mag wells themselves, this one is made from stamped steel that's flared out. It has a cutout here in the back. And that is an original magwell, by the way. This one here is actually, it has no cutout in the back. It's much thicker metal. And the reason is simple, the way these are made. The ATI receiver, in the upper tube is the receiver on this gun, is two halves. There's a seam here and on the bottom. And you can see little screws throughout, two halves put together. The magwell is part of the receiver. On the original gun, both this semi-auto conversion and the original original, this upper tube, I forgot I took the mag out. This upper tube is stamped in rolled steel, it's fluted. And this magwell is actually put on and pinned on. There's a pin here that, that holds the magwell to the receiver and then it's mated with the flutes to kind of keep it. But most originals I've seen, unless they're just brands making new, there's actually quite a bit of play with the magwell because it's really just pressed and pinned on to the stamped uh, receiver. Now, the original MP38s had a fluted machined receiver. The MP40 introduced the stamped fluted receiver. The MP40 itself, as far as history, this isn't really a history video, but just quickly, it is essentially, in World War I, Germany was the first nation to really field in large numbers, or at least any numbers of note, a uh, submachine gun, although that term wasn't used at that time. It was called a machine pistol. Yes, I know, Italy had the Villa Perosa, but that's a, not really. This it was the first thing. It was called the MP, MP18. Bergman. It fired 9mm Luger. It also used the same snail mags as the Luger, artillery Luger, the, the LP-08. It could also feed from uh, later double stack single feed mags designed by Hugo Schmeisser. The MP-18 would be produced at the end of the war and then would go out of production because of the Treaty of Versailles. It would lead to the MP-28, which Mr. Schmeisser also worked on. That in turn would lead to the MP36, which he did not work on. It was mostly a, a machined gun, machined steel, finely made, just like the MP18. Then the MP38 was designed at Arma work. Now, Arma did not employ Schmeisser. A lot of people call the MP40 a Schmeisser. The only thing that's really Schmeisser about it is the magazine design. He, ha he held the patent on it and a few other parts, but he did not directly work on the MP38 or MP40. So calling it a Schmeisser is kind of a misnomer. Kind of like calling an MP18 a Bergman is a misnomer because Schmeisser did work on it heavily. But it was designed at the Bergman factory, so that's kind of where that came from. The MP38 really introduced the second generation of submachine guns. These were guns that gave less attention to fit and finish machined parts and went to mass production is their primary goal. They wanted to have submachine sub guns that they could crank out in large numbers, fast, easy to machine, didn't require heavily skilled workers to make most of the parts, and also many of the parts could be farmed out to smaller industries and businesses. The MP38 was the first, though it still used many machine parts. The MP40 was a further refinement which used even more stamped machined excuse me, stamped metal parts, although it did use some machine parts still, but many of its parts were stamped steel at the time. So it was really revolutionary. It was also the first gun to be truly compact. If you look at previous machine guns, they're, they're still pretty large. They kind of look like small rifles or small, some, uh, small machine guns. The um, MP38 and MP40 were the first submachine guns to go into production with an underfolding stock. This one is pinned closed for legal reasons, but you can see this is the original stock. The button just doesn't work. It's a good tubular steel stock, although it wasn't particularly rigid. 
it only locked on one side, so these were known for failing in the field, but not at a high enough rate that it was a problem. But it was one of the weaker points of the, of the design. But the stock was quick and easy to make, and it let the gun be extremely compact by the standards of the day. During World War II, three main companies would make the MP40. You would have Irma, the originator. You would have Hanel, and you would have Steyr in Austria. All told, including MP38 and MP40, they would produce about 1,100,000 before production ended in 1945. Some sources say it ended in 1944. However, I have seen 1945 dated guns, especially Steyr's. So that's kind of the rundown. As with a lot of World War II guns, the MP40 continued to see use after the war. And there's a lot of differences between the MP38 and MP40, although they're minor and really not for this video. So that's the background here on these guns. Back to how these differ. One thing that really impresses me that they did is the rear sight. This is a sling out of the way. Apologies for that. These leather slings. <laughs> this is the original rear sight. It has the same flip. This is the reproduction on the ATI, of course. And they did an excellent job. The notch on the new gun is a little bit wider and deeper, probably to accommodate more modern shooter's tastes. But the patterning on the edges to lift it is very close. Very, very nice job. This one has more pronounced screw holes where it's screwed into the receiver. This one is actually welded to the receiver with little indentions. The spring on this is a little bit stiffer, but with a little more positive detent. It's a little easier to adjust. But keep in mind, this is meant for civilians. They, I think they did a fantastic job of replicating this rear sight. Likewise, the rear sling swivels, they did a very good job. This has this lip here. Now this originally was because of the stamp steel construction. On this one, it's more cosmetic. On this one, oh, I've got a sling there. I don't think you're gonna be able to see it too well. But there is a lip, and that's because this is literally a steel insert. Think of a, um, a layer war K98, how those sling swivels are, the front swing sw sling swivels. The front swivel is the same. The bar itself is very close on both guns. It feels like it might be a little bit wider on the ATI, and it doesn't have, this one up here does have a notch for the receiver, so it's timed properly. I don't believe this one does. If it does, I think it's, yeah, it does, but I think it's, it may not be cosmetic. Either way, I think they did a very good job on the front sling swivel, as well as the rear. They both use a very similar bar barrel nut. The ATI is a little bit simplified. This one has a larger flat in between the main flats. This one really doesn't. It's got a tiny little flat. That said, there were different barrel nut variations, even in original production, so. Now getting onto the barrel, we're gonna find more differences. This is the original. This bar was meant to rest the gun up against the side of a vehicle. This one's made out of alloy. They were also made of steel and Bakelite. It is pinned in up here and easily replace, re replaceable. This was considered a semi-disposable part where if it broke, you could replace it. On the ATI, we have a very similar looking part, even down to a hole here. This hole is cosmetic though. This is part of the barrel. It does not come off. It looks the part, but it is not removable. Now, the front sight bases are quite different. The sight hood is held on with a roll pin here, and the sights underneath it, different. Flip it up here and see it a little better. See the shape there? On the ATI, the front sight hood is a sleeve. 
If I unscrew this, you can see it gets loose. It's held on by the muzzle nut. And the reason it's easily pulled off is this front sight is replaceable. They mail these with um, different front sights so you can adjust for elevation. And the way the sight's attached is also quite different than on the original. On the original, looking at the muzzle nut, it has a different shape. And there's a spring-loaded um, wire here. Or sorry, it's kind of a spring steel wire that holds it on. You just unscrew it, but it's held on with little clicks. On the ATI, we have a plunger, kind of like an STG-44. In fact, this plunger's come out of whack. It will do that occasionally on these, I've noticed. Get this back in. There we go. Yeah, sometimes it'll go in and not want to pop back out. Not a big deal. Come on. Kind of have to wiggle things. But yeah. This doesn't use the original style. It uses its uh, its own style. More like an AK or an STG, as I said. I'll have to dink with that. For some reason, that this one, this one kind of gets stuck a little bit in there. Kind of have to jiggle it. Not a big deal. So the barrels, though they look the same, the details are quite different. The same goes for the lower. This uses the original striker or seer i should say and it's a striker gun and basically it's the original spring made into a striker held back by a seer the original seer so when you pull the trigger instead of releasing the entire bolt on this semi auto it releases the original seer excuse me the original spring which hits the the bolt and firing pin this is your takedown you pull it down and rotate to take the gun apart. The upper and lower just twist off in that case. It's basically a peg. When it's up, there's a peg poke, poking into the upper, the tube. And when you pull it down, the peg is taken out, and you can just rotate these up and apart. On the ATI, we have a similar looking control down here, although it's a little larger. And this is your safety. This is safe. Excuse me, this is safe. This is fire here. The control is a little bigger. Put it on safe just to show you. So it does not use the original takedown. It, it's there, but it's uh, safety. How do you get these apart? Well, they're not really meant to be disassembled like a military gun. There's this pin here. It has a C-clip on it. You have to pop the C-clip off and then drive this pin out, and then you can separate the guns. So while it can be done, you'll need to do it at a workbench, not in the field like on the original. The trigger is similar feeling, but this one is a cast metal part. This one is a stamped steel part. This one releases or drops a sear, which lets a striker go forward, like similar to an original. This one actually lets a hammer go forward, so it's more like on an AR-15. Different trigger group, obviously, but um, yeah. Now, the biggest difference, the bolt. The bolt is very, very different on the ATI. This is an original. It does fire closed, but it does still have the push-in safety here. You can lock it into the gun. The bolt handle is also removable. We have a J hook in the back. And as I said, we have a striker in here. And if you look on this side, here's the ejection port with the original extractor and all that. Notice how it's very close to the surface. And notice where the um, where the bolt handles at. We're right at the edge of the Bakelite handguard. And the channel runs all the way to the back. When you disassemble this, you just pull the bolt back and out of the receiver. On 
on the ATI. This is our bolt. First off, you can see the handle is a very different shape. It's a simple round shape. There's no safety in it. It does kind of pull in and out, but that's just because of how it's made. It's not, you can't push it in. Notice where the channel's at. It starts quite far back here and only runs to here. It doesn't go all the way back. So you can't just pull the bolt back out when disassembled. You can pull it back and lock it in the J notch, which is kind of cool. But the channel, the bolt travel and all that is much shorter. Another kind of interesting, if also odd feature mag, is this gun has a last round bolt hold open. See? And there's not a manual release, so you just drop your mag. Let it go. Now, also looking at the ejection port, we have a smaller ejection port set much deeper. You can see those receiver walls. Again, these are not stamped receiver tubes. These are machined cast tubes. So it's set deeper. Whereas on the original, it's much more exposed here, larger port. Bolts closer to the surface. And we have no type of bolt hole open, of course. That wasn't a feature much in submachine guns. The only one I can think of back in that day that had one was the, uh, was the Thompson. Now, I don't want to disassemble either of these on camera, but I did bring an original bolt out, sort of. Here we go. I brought it out because mechanically this is very interesting. This is a bolt group out of a Portuguese FBP, which was a submachine gun they made immediately after World War II, and they copied the features they liked best from the grease gun, the Sten, and the MP40. When they copied the bolt from the MP40, they did such a good job that these are literally drop-in exchangeable parts for original German MP40s, so much so that guys who run submachine guns drop these in to save wear and tear on their um, original bolt parts. Now there's a few different styles that Germany did. This style has the fixed firing pin on the bolt face. And it's flat back here. Fits in. The original style had the firing pin here on the spring, which ran through a channel on the bolt. Midway in the war, they, Germany went to this style with the fixed firing pin, and at the very end, they had this style of bolt with a standard spring. So this spring is, to me, what's really neat about the MP40. There's a spring in here. It is telescoping. What I like about it, it's unique, it's simple, it's the very definition of a captive spring, and the fact that we're kind of sleeved means there's a certain hydraulic, or I shouldn't say, I guess pneumatic would be the right word, sorry, pneumatic delay. So what would happen in the original submachine gun, this would be your bolt, it would be back for the closed bolt, bolt position, if you let the sear off, that comes forward, fires, and then the recoil pushes it back, and then fires again. Until you let off the trigger, the sear comes up and catches the bolt. I think it's kind of kind of a neat design, very distinctive. The semi-auto here is very similar. We have the original bolt, but we have the original striker back here, uh, made from the original spring. So when we cock it, because this has to fire from a closed bolt, the bolt goes forward on a separate spring that's newly added, and the original spring, telescoping spring, is held up by the original sear, and then forward and hits the bolt. And in the bolt now we have a spring-loaded firing pin that it hits.
So it's an interesting way of doing it. Keeps a lot of the original feel, especially with the trigger. Whereas the ATI goes to a wholly new bolt system. We have only one spring for the whole bolt. It's a wide spring here, you can see. Very standard coil spring. And when it's cocked, you have a hammer back. And when you let go, the hammer goes forward and hits the firing pin. So internally, quite different. Now that said, this lower does separate from this upper, like an original. Although, again, you drive out this pin instead of pulling a latch down here and then rotating off. This probably has a little tighter fit because we have a secure pin, but it also is much more time consuming to, um, to take apart. So yeah, that's pretty much a walkthrough of these two guns. Well, mo mostly this gun, just using that one as comparison. Final thoughts. I like it. I still like the ATI. Where is my mag? There it is. This gun here required me to find an original parts kit, send it off to a custom a manufacturer to have it built it took a lot of time and a sig not insignificant sum of money not full auto money of course but you know a couple of thousand this gun here is being brought in by an importer pretty big company ready to go and it cost five fifty six hundred and fifty dollars the trade-off is this gun is built from original parts and use as much of the original functionality as much as is allowed by the law of the law this gun here looks the part but uses no original parts and is dimensionally different so as far as i know the only original part that'll fit it is in a, uh, the sling the mags won't fit the muzzle devices are different sights are different and definitely the internals are radically different i haven't tried to take say the grip panels off but i bet dimensionally they're they're different now, the, the broad dimensions, length, height, weight, they're very similar. This is still a little bit lighter than an original like this, either full auto or semi-conversion. But it still has a good heft to it, a good weight. Unless you have them side by side, you, you won't notice. Long story short, for someone on a budget, this is an excellent option if you need an MP40 in your collection. For a reenactor, this is an even better option. On the field, it'll look just like an original. You don't have to worry about wear and tear on original. ATI supports it with a warranty and spare parts. Extra mags are available for 30, 40 bucks, whereas original mags are $150 now. These mags, though different from originals, have the same pros and cons as the original Smicer design, namely the double column single feed. They are just as tough to load. And I'm going to guess if you have any feeding issues with this gun, they can be traced to the magazine pattern because that pattern is just kind of known. The Sten gun also uses it, and that pattern is just not known for 100% reliability. Bolt hold open there. But yeah, all in all, for the coin, I am very impressed with this gun. If I did not already have this one over here, I might just grab one of these and call it good because it does look the part and it is at least made in Germany. Obviously not Nazi Germany and not in the 40s, but it does look good. Looks looks correct. So yeah, I'm going to give it, uh, you know, if I was a grading system, I'd give it a B plus. Obviously it uses modern manufacturing techniques for the furniture and the receiver is made absolutely differently from uh, from an original original being stamped steel this is um cast it's either i don't know if it's even steel. it might just be really thick alloy i think it is but um it's it's since it is thick it's it's plenty fine for a nine millimeter i mean polymer is fine for a nine millimeter we're not shooting a rifle cartridge here so yeah we were very happy with this gun the way it came in so if you have any questions or comments please post them below if you like the video, please click like if you have time. If you would like to subscribe, we'd really appreciate that too. We appreciate every viewer we get. As always, this is Misha. And please tune in again next time.
for more hopefully unique and interesting videos. We'll catch you then.